All right, it's time for us to begin. <clears throat> we have been looking for several months now at the Bible in the news, prophecy. I've never known a time in my life when prophecy is literally laying right there before us the way Amen. it is now. Amen. Amen. It's kind of scary and kind of exciting at the same time. And just a couple of things as we begin. COVID-19 made for an interesting year. Right at the beginning, masks or no masks became a political statement. And it's been shaping up that way unbelievably. Everything we do in this country, we have to make it a left and a right thing. Uh, you look at California. California is the state in the union with the most COVID cases. And they are the most locked down state in the union. Okay, that tells you everything you need to know. The lockdown does not stop the spread. I mean, the st statistics don't lie. Liars use statistics, but statistics don't lie. The most locked down state in the union is also the state that has the most cases. So I just put all that out there. It's become such a political thing that we don't even know what the truth is. We don't know what to believe. No. And then the U.S. election, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, doesn't make any difference. We have entered a time that it's going to be a different four years than under Trump. I was never a Trump supporter. He's a lousy individual. But everything, pretty much almost everything he did is precisely what I elected him to do. Okay, I don't care anything about him. That's between him and the Lord. But a bully to push back on what had been pushed on us for years was what we elected Trump to do. That's changed. He's, he's no longer there. And so there's going to be big changes. And we're not the only ones who are on edge about this election. The rest of the world, they don't know what's coming either. But they know that Biden is going to be quite different than Trump in a lot of ways. China is popping the champagne bottles. They couldn't be happier. And that's on one side of it. And you've got Israel's really upset. Uh, some of the folks that we know there have told me that the Israelis are really depressed about what has happened. And if for no other reason, Trump, what Trump did for Israel is over the edge. Not only moving the, the capital to Jerusalem, but far beyond that getting Muslim nations to normalize relations with him, this guy should get the peace prize. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. Mm -hmm. And there are still more that are going to come on board, and that's because, the, and we've talked about this before, the Muslim nations are coming to the conclusion that while they don't love the Jews, they can count on the Jews when they can't count on the other Muslim nations. That's a pretty big deal. In fact, Trump leveraged that in order to make those normalization. It's not a peace deal, but they normalize relations. They now have ambassadors, and uh, they will be able to have flights to those nations and back and forth. And that, that's going to be huge. And so what makes the world go around? Money. Money. <laughs> right? So whatever else is true, those Muslim nations and Israel are going to make great money off of those deals. So the whole world is on edge with Biden coming in because already, before, before the 20th, already he said that he was, maybe on day one if I remember what he said, was going to restore the money to the Palestinians. Trump had cut it off and he's going to restore that money to the Palestinians. So Israel's on edge. The whole world, depending on where they're falling on it, 
the election was a big deal. And whatever else is true, it was a shaking. COVID-19 is still shaking the, not just this country, but the earth. We've never seen anything like that in our lifetime that has had that far-reaching an effect. And it, it's setting us up for a lot of things. When you shake stuff, it falls apart. You find out the different parts. Uh, you can take a bunch of sand and a basket to use as a sieve, and you can filter that out. If it's been outside, you need to get rid of all the cat dung. And so you get the point. So that's what shaking does. And of course, uh, Jonathan Kahn's books that he's written has been all about God does shakings before he brings judgments. Now that's a really important thing to note. You look at the history of Israel, and God told them what he was going to do if they didn't stop. Amen. And then when the time came, he shook them. And when they didn't pay any attention, then he brought judgment. Amen. That's the pattern that God, that's his pattern. Well, so we've had shakings. You realize the things that have happened just in the last few years in this country? From 9-11 and forward, we've had a lot of shakings. Amen. And one of the things that shakings do for nations is show what's there. I mentioned last week, just as an example, this is huge. There have been self-proclaimed apostolic prophets in the charismatic movement have created a problem for themselves. Back last summer, they started saying, while they were taking up offerings, they said, I had a dream last night and God revealed to me that Trump was going to have a second term. You didn't know about that? It was all over the place in the charismatic realms. Yeah. And it's been almost fun to watch these guys as we come closer and closer and closer to the 20th when Trump is no longer president and they're found to be lying prophets. It's been almost fun to watch the gymnastics that they're going through say, yeah, this is the way it's going to work out. You just trust God. Okay, he's not president. They're lying prophets. Now in the Old Testament, we knew what to do with lying oh. prophets. <laughs> we don't get to do that in the New Testament. So, don't miss my point. There's been a shaking going on, and a shaking reveals things. These false prophets are now revealed. And another thing that shaking is going to do is it's going to reveal those of us that are serious. And for me, how serious I am as a Christian. How much am I willing to be a Christian? Amen. And that's the reason why I passed out that thing about persecution. The rest of the world's been dealing with that for some time. It's come to America now. Amen. And Trump made the statement, man, this guy, his intel is off the charts accurate. He said, they're coming after you. I'm in the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We see that. They don't want to shut Trump up. They want to shut you up. Amen. They want to shut you up on Facebook. They want to shut you up on Twitter. And they're going to do it. We'll move to other platforms or worse. There's no telling what could happen. I'm, I, I'll, I can envision so another thing that shaking is doing. We're finding out our politicians where they are. Amen. Mitch McConnell has always been a rhino. Amen. A Republican in name only. Yeah. And now that Trump, of course he's mad at Trump. Who isn't mad at Trump in this country? I'm mad at Trump. He cost himself the election of a couple of dumb things that he did. Yeah. You know? Amen. May have destroyed the Republican Party. Well, and that's my whole point. The Republican Party needs to be shook. We need to find out who the rhinos are, and there may out of this come a different party. I, but don't miss my point. You shake things like that, and the things fall apart into their individual pieces, and you see what's there. Amen. So what we're seeing is bad, and yet 
necessary. We need to find out who the false teachers are, false prophets. We need to find out who in the Republican Party is actually a conservative and who's not. We need to find out in our church who are real Christians and who are not. We're finding out how 20 to 30 percent of our people are not back. Some of them legitimately for good reason. They're afraid to be around. They don't want to get the COVID. I get that. That's fine. But because we're putting it online, we're making it easy for the lazy Christians to be lazy. Lazier. Amen. Now, I'm sorry if you don't like that. When I signed on, I didn't tell you I was only going to tell things that was good. So this shaking, while it's going to be painful, it reveals. And I, From the beginning, I have said, I don't know whether this COVID-19 is from the devil or whether it's from God. I can't tell. We can say that if the devil is the author of it, the Lord is going to use it. Amen. Not for purposes the devil had, but for the purposes that God had. Amen. And I, this is just, this is a maxim for our times. This shaking seems to be a bad thing, but it's showing us. You know, it, it, uh, Judy and I, we keep extra food and water. And we are a little bit of preppers. And we began through this shaking to begin to think maybe it would be a good thing for us to get more extra food than what we think we will need so that when our neighbors come or my daughter and son-in-law come and need food, I won't have to say, sorry, go away or worse. You realize it could come to that. Amen. So the shaking has been uncomfortable and yet good for us because now we're putting some food aside and we'll rotate that food. There's not going to be any waste to it. We'll eat it and rotate it through and, and buy more, but we will have food for our neighbors in the event that they need it and they're not prepared. All my neighbors are, are uh, uh, I think they're preppers as well because they're part of uh, um, IHOP. And I, and we're going to talk a little bit about IHOP and, and that bunch. Anyway, so any questions or thoughts before we move on? Okay. Well, so, Pastor, uh -huh. <laughs> um, I wanted to add one thing to what I said that Sunday. I didn't think about it Sunday. I really appreciate the guts you have. You as a pastor have got tremendous <laughs> guts to tell us all this and prepare us all this when uh, uh, it's um, it's tough for you to do it again. I appreciate you doing it because it is gutsy to do this. Well, thank you, but you know, there might be an alternative reason for it. It could be a lack of brains, not guts. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't think so. We'll see, time will tell. So we're going to talk about the toxic church tonight. And it's going to be a bit uncomfortable. John chapter 15, verse 18. John chapter 15 and verse 18. John chapter 15, verse 18. Jesus speaking to his disciples. He said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Can you imagine the disciples... They thought they were on the cusp of a messianic experience. They thought Jesus was the Messiah. And He was. And now everything is going to be rainbows and pie and cake. And everybody, they're going to be leaders in this new messianic movement. And people are going to love them. And Jesus says to them, if the world hate you, Peter must have been saying, What? They would not have had any point of reference to understand what Jesus was saying. But he was saying it, and they were going to find out. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the world 
the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this come at the pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in the law. They hated me without a cause. So the servants, not greater than the master, if they hated Jesus, why would I think they will do anything different with me? The people who get saved won't hate me, but the people who don't want to hear it, those people of this world, they're going to hate me. Next, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Passage we've looked at, I want to look at verses 7 through 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. So this is, this is the rapture of the church and the Antichrist coming to power and all that's going to be coming later on. And Paul reveals, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And this is one of only two or three places in the King James Bible that it is inferior to the other translations. Nobody in our age understands letting. That's old King James language for restraining. Nobody in our society knows that, but that's what the word means. He that restrains will continue to restrain until he, and that's significant, Who's the restrainer? It's the Holy Spirit. It's a he. Until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, the Antichrist, be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. You know, it's amazing the things you see there in the Bible. Paul says there that the Lord is going to consume the Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth. Over in the book of Revelation... What comes out of Jesus' mouth? A sharp, two-edged sword. What is the Bible? The Bible is the sword of the Spirit. These things are all connected up. So he's going to consume with the Spirit of his mouth, Spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. The Antichrist is going to be able to do miracles, seemingly. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now verse 12 describes our days like no other. The damned, those who reject Christ, they believe not the truth. CNN, MSNBC. They also define Sodom and Gomorrah. It's one of the two signs that that Jesus gave in his private rebuke to the disciples, Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah's day. Mm -hmm. And those are very revealing. So, because they would not believe, because they did not love the truth, because they had pleasure in unrighteousness, okay, so that's a, that's a certain kind of a person. Somebody who has pleasure in unrighteousness. Somebody who prefers not the truth. That person, when this point comes, out in the future, after the church is gone, the Antichrist is revealed, at that point, God's going to say, I'm done. He's going to wash his hands of them. And he's going to send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. 
Well, who's lying about what? It's a very interesting question. I believe the answer to that is when Christians are taken in what we call the rapture, it's talked about all over the New Testament, it's what Paul said was the blessed hope of the church. When the church is raptured, now how's that going to happen? I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how a black cow eats green grass and gives white milk, but I like it. So the rapture is going to happen one of these days. And when it does, imagine, try to picture worldwide in a moment. Every believer, everybody who believes in Christ, gone. I mean, what kind of chaos is that going to create? Now, there may be far fewer believers than you actually know. <laughs> there may not be as many as you think. Billy Graham said to the Southern Baptist Convention long about 1978 or 9, must have been 1979. No. No, it would have been 1976. Is here in Kansas City. And he's preaching to the pastor's conference. He took his finger and he said, half of you are lost. Now, I don't know how Billy knew or if he knew, but something prompted him to say that. If half of the pastors sitting there were lost, and I don't think they were, but let's pull a figure out of the air like they do on MSNBC. Uh, 25% of those pastors of the Southern Baptist Convention are lost, <coughs> not been saved. What does that say for the larger picture of the church in America? What does that say for the world? So there may not be as many as you think, but there's going to be millions, right? We're all agreed there's going to be millions. Who all at once, they're no longer there. Of course, you know, when they depict that in movies and so forth, they, uh, you know, there's the airplane that begins to go down because the pilot was a Christian. There's all that. You, you can imagine what that's going to be like. The chaos that that's going to create. You know, the employer now only has, you know, three quarters of his work staff. What is that? You, you see what I'm saying? If you begin to play that out, that's going to be a, a worldwide huge event. That the rapture, if, if the rapture happens, if the Bible's true, that's going to be beyond my comprehension to understand what that's going to be like. That chaos is going to be created. Okay. The next passage is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells young Timothy what it's going to be like in the latter times, in the latter days. He says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, the last days literally has been since Jesus left. It's been 2,000 years now. Whenever I think about that, I think about Moses. Moses went up the mount to receive the Ten Commandments. And he was gone for a long time. He was gone long enough that the people said, ah, wild animals have killed him or something's happened to him. He's not coming back. Aaron, we want you to make us a golden calf. We wish we were back in Egypt. And so Aaron takes some of their gold and he makes a golden calf and they rise up to play, which means they had an orgy. And then here comes Moses. And Moses got mad, didn't he? And he said, Aaron, what's up? And Aaron said, well, Moses, I, I took this gold and I threw it in the fire and out came this golden calf. That's what scripture says. I mean, a guy just could not bring himself to say, I did it. But he did. Now, my point is this. He was gone a long time, and a lot of them stopped believing he was going to come back. That's a picture of where the church is going to be in the last time. 2,000 years we've been waiting for Christ. Is he going to come back? Absolutely. A lot of people have stopped looking for it. Because it's been a long time, they've given up. 
I would venture to say that uh, three quarters, again, I'm pulling a figure out of the air like CNN does. Three quarters of the pastors in America never preach on the end times. A, because they don't know anything about it, and B, because Jesus has been gone a long time, they don't think he's coming back. Is he coming back? Yes. Is he going to be late? Never. Is it because we have no perseverance? I mean, We're humans. For, you know, we have expectations that things happen. You know, that, I mean, in those, Moses said, and they expected and believed the man could not be up on the mountain for 40 days. Yep. And, or, you know, whatever the case may be. This has to happen now, and because it hasn't, I'm not going to believe it. Well, and, and again, you bring up an excellent point. This, again, is a bit of a shake. And that reveals what's there, doesn't it? We're, we're 2,000 years, so one lifetime. No, no pastor in America has lived several lifetimes. But in this lifetime, because it's been a long time, they've given up believing. They've given up preaching it. But that doesn't mean he's not going to come back and not going to be late. Next to the last verse in the Bible says Jesus is coming back. Yeah. Revelation 20 through 20. So if Jesus doesn't come back, the whole Bible's a lie. The last verse says his uh, uh, grace will always be with us. Well, that's good news. <laughs> okay, where was I? I got sidetracked. So in the last days, perilous times shall come. That's where we are. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous. Can you spell Amazon? Huh? Yeah, that's what I've gone. You know, Judy used to get after me when I'd order something off of Amazon. She said, "What'd you order now?" She'd get all over me, and I had to calm her down. And say, "Honey, that's what I do when she gets all that." Honey. Oh. Actually, if I did that, it'd just make her mad. <laughs> I'd say, sweetie, <laughs> we don't go out to Walmart anymore. If we were walking down the aisle and there was a $10 item and I bought that and put it in the cart, you wouldn't even say anything. I spent $10 on Amazon because I didn't go to Walmart. So it's changed up everything. But it's also... Man, Amazon is really good at predicting what I need. <laughs> right? <laughs> Based on what I've bought, <coughs> it gives me suggestions. And I would never have thought of that. Click. And so we are, do you realize that change that has happened in our society, social media and all of it, it has made us Instant gratification addicts. If I send you an email and you don't answer me in 15 minutes, I want to know why you're mad at me. And just for whatever it's worth, I don't feel like I have to answer your email or your text messages when you send them. I consider them to be an interruption in my life and I'll get around to it when I get ready. I'm being a little smart, but I, I don't let it God my life. Okay, But the instant gratification, that was just not the case 30 or 40 years ago. You realize what a change that is? I think it's a part of what's making us crazy, but anyway. Okay, covetous. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, can we say God at Sodom and Gomorrah? Truce breakers, false accusers, impeach him! False accusers, facts don't matter, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. What? Why would you despise those that are good? We are toxic to our world. 
They consider us to be a blithe. They consider us to be toxic to their world. Okay, so... The recurring revelation phrase that I think is revealing is they that dwell upon the earth. That recurs several times. The first time is in reference to believers. Uh, it says there in Revelation 6.10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? Okay, so the believers are saying, how long are you not going to come to the earth and do? So it's perfectly legitimate for us to say in our day, how long, O Lord? There's really nothing there. And, and I have begun to pray that more and more. Lord, how much longer could it be? You know, and I, I've, I've told you before, and, and I'm not being cute when I say this. I really believe it from the bottom of my heart. I understand the judgment of God. I don't understand the grace of God. Yeah. Amen to that. If I were God, I'd have been back a long time ago and I'd have brought the judgment of God. Yeah. Yeah. But God is not willing that any should perish, Peter said, but that all might come to a knowledge of Him. That's Amen. why Amen. He loves lost people more than I do. Okay. The next three times, though, that phrase, they that dwell upon the earth, refer to unbelievers. Revelation 11.10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. A picture of the church. These are two witnesses over the book of Revelation. When these guys are finally dead, when they're finally dead, and their bodies are starting to rot, it says they're going to be so happy they're going to oh, send yeah. gifts to one another. Yep. Would you agree with me that's an unnatural hatred? Absolutely. And that's not even rational. Absolutely. What does that remind you of? Right How much they hate Trump? Mm -hmm. Whatever you think about Trump, why would you hate somebody that bad? It's an unnatural, I think, demonic hatred. The next time that phrase occurs is in Revelation 13, 14. And deceiveth them that dwell upon the earth. What did Jesus say was the big issue to his disciples in Matthew 24? The very first thing he told them about his return, the very first thing was, be not deceived. Amen. No other word describes the end times like that. We're living in a time of deception. And deceived them that dwell upon the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Wow, there's a whole sermon series right there. But they that dwell upon the earth are unbelievers. Amen. The third group, third time it's used, is in chapter 17, verse 8. The beast that thou shalt was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. This Antichrist and the false prophet, see there's going to be an unholy trinity. There's going to be a political power. Uh, there's going to be a a uh, spiritual entity, a false prophet. Uh, and so when that comes, it's going to do it in such a way that the people who are given a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, God's going to give it to them. Okay, go ahead and believe whatever you want. And this guy's going to do some razzle-dazzle, some hocus-pocus, and appear to be miracles. Maybe they, it says that he will do miracles. And the world is going to wonder after the beast. I always wanted somebody to have that kind of hero worship with me. That they would just think that the ground I walked on was just precious. No, I actually never wanted that. But you know, people have heroes. 
And that's not a good thing, usually. We need to look up to people. We need to have people we look up to. That's a good thing. But when you make a hero out of somebody, well, the old saying is, our heroes have toes of partly iron, partly clay. They will fall apart. The best of our heroes, I, I've had heroes in my life. Adrian Rogers was one of them. But he wasn't perfect. He had flaws. But this guy is going to be such that everybody is going to just wonder and be in awe at all the things that he would do. So, I was going to continue and talk about the deprogramming that's coming upon us. But our time is gone, pretty much. Let, let me hit it real light. Okay? Because these are kind of scary times that we're living. Trump supporters are seen as needing to be deprogrammed. You know, they, Katie Couric and others have been in the news saying, we have got to figure out a way to deprogram these Trump cult people. That's what we're called. Even though I would say that, I don't know, I'll pull a figure out of the air, half of the people that voted for Trump don't love the guy. It's not about him. Right. But Katie Couric and CNN and all those idiots, the Bible calls them fools, they look on us that we need to be deprogrammed. And it's a foreshadowing. What does it mean and what's it going to look like? Well, deprogrammed refers to the attempt to unbrainwash cult followers. You know, the funny thing about that is they, brainwashing was a 1950s, 1960s thing that the communists were supposed to do to people. But you know what they found out when they, when, they, when they tried to brainwash people? The CIA actually did experiments and tried to brain. It doesn't work. You can't brain, you can't make people brainwash. Now they even made a movie, what was the name of that movie uh, where the guy was brainwashed by the communists and was gonna assassinate the president? What? The Manchurian candidate. Okay, that's all been debunked. You can't brainwash people. But they're taking that language, and they think we need to be unbrainwashed. We've been brainwashed by Trump. We need to be unbrainwashed, if that's a, even a word. So this is going to be a conflicting problem for them. And I think this is kind of funny. Because the leftists, the CNN bunch, it's going to be a problem for them because of what China's doing to the Uyghurs. You know, more information just come out in the last few days that they've got them in concentration camps, or what they call re-education camps. So in order, if they want to try to do that here, they're going to have to be okay with it going on there. And that may actually feed into the way that they will do it. They'll say, okay, so China recognizes that sometimes there are people who need to be brain unbrainwashed. That's the Trump people here in America. That actually may be the way that that plays out. And I think it's hilarious that they're going to have that conflicting problem. I love it when liberals don't know what to do and they have to jump around. I'd probably love some of the wrong things. What do you think? I think you got a problem on their hands. <laughs> yeah, and, and we are, and that's the whole point of what I'm talking about. The toxic church is in the way of what they want to do. When the church is gone, they'll be free to do what they want. Well, what it looks like could be coming down the pipe kind of remind me of the old saying, the beatings will continue to morale improve. They will continue to what? Until the morale. Beatings will continue to morale improve. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Morale. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like that. The latest thing that on the news, or whatever, they said we need to get rid of Newsmax. Yeah, OAN. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's how they're going to deprogram us. Well, and they've got rid of Parlor. Don't know whether it'll come back or not. Yeah, it, it's astounding that something baked right into. In fact, the Constitution is what it was. The, the framers gave the Constitution, they put it to the 13 colonies, and the colonies all said, 
Okay, we'll be on board with that if you add these 10 amendments. Mm -hmm. And the first one, before the states would sign on, before the colonies would sign on to America, we have to have a guarantee of the right of free speech. The biggest thing is that our, they said, our Constitution is wholly inadequate to govern an, an immoral people. Yep. And that's what we're up against. I don't know whether it's Washington or Franklin or one of those founders. I think yeah. Madison, I don't yeah, remember. Okay. But one of them, they said, this is only going to work if you have a moral people. So what's happened in America? As morality has gone down, people are willing to do things that 30 years ago they wouldn't do. Okay, so there's always been voting fraud. Always has been. Chicago was famous for dead people voting, right? As long as I've been alive. Yeah. But most people wouldn't do that because the level of morality didn't allow for that. Most people want to do the right thing. We come to the place now, and I, I'm not saying that the election would have been different. I'm saying that the voting fraud was off the scale from what it had been before because morality has gone down. Amen. I don't think the number of warm bodies voting made any difference because I think they dialed the number of votes Absolutely. that they wanted. That's just my opinion. Absolutely. What do I know? Bill Barr says I'm an idiot. I don't think he's too smart. Maybe. Okay. One more thought and then we got to quit. <laughs> How long before they come for our Bibles? That's a rhetorical question, right? <laughs> well, you know, they're going to live on our Bibles as more dangerous, maybe, than our guns. Well, let me tell you the next thing that's coming, because I can't answer the question. Yeah. But the next thing that's coming, and I've, I've, I've watched this and thought about it and prayed over it a lot the last 20 years. And I've always believed, and I, I'm convicted now that it's true all the more. What they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, if your church preacher is going to preach against homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, pick whatever the flavor of the day is. You can do that, but it will cost you a tax. Yeah. Or if you won't marry gay people. <laughs> the, the, the funny thing about that is, the most they can do right now is they can take away our tax exempt status. Yeah. You know a funny little thing about the tax exempt status? We don't need it. We should never have done it. Yeah. A dirty little secret about the tax-exempt status of a church. We are a corporation. And a corporation is a creation of the state. And I believe that's going to play in to what's coming upon us. They're going to say, you have tax-exempt status as a, as a corporation that, that we created. We are. Our church is uh, a corporation. You have to hire gay people, etc. You have to follow the government guidelines. And also they might try to take, a, I've heard about taking away our 401ks. I mean, it's pretty much... They're going to do that. Well, the way they're going to do that you know what I mean? is the Great Reset. Mm -hmm. You're not going to own anything, but you will be happy. <laughs> that's their that's their tagline yeah. and and we've talked about the great reset quite a bit but we probably need to talk some more about it Biden's tagline in his election campaign was build back better that came from the great reset they're going to build it back better. and what that means and I, I hate to go over the territory again but the build back better, what they mean by that is, okay, capitalism's okay, but it, it runs amok when it goes so far. We've got to bring it back in now. And communism has some good things, and we're going to merge capitalism and communism. You won't own anything, but you'll be happy. You think I'm lying about that? There's already a congressman who said, we need to not just give $2,000 to people now. We need to do that every month. 